Welcome to the latest episode of Opening Bid. I am your trail guide, Brian Sazi, a.k.a. the executive editor here at Yahoo Finance. Now let's make some money and get a lot smarter. Very special guest on today's episode. I don't even know where to begin with him. Uh, he's an investor, author, retail expert, and Wall Street Beats partner, Mr. Jeff Mackey. Jeff, did I get all the titles right? I'm an experienced trader. I got about eight more, but you tell me. I'm Methuselah, man. I'm 105 years old. We could talk about whatever. It's, it's basically, there's nothing you could list that I probably haven't done at least a little bit of. But hey, uh, it's great to see you, man, it's, including hosting you on, on I, some of your earliest appearances ever in broadcast. Can, can, you, can, you, let, can you let me bring this stuff up, man? I mean, I was going to bring this up before we get going. I mean, the quick backstory is uh, I'm going to call you the founding host uh, of Yahoo Finance video back in 2011 here, really getting the, uh, the show going. You essentially pluck me out of obscurity and show me how to do all of this on-air stuff. So to you, Jeff Mackey, I'm just going to say a quick thank you uh, and welcome home. You have not been on Yahoo Finance since February 3rd, 2015. And what you don't see here, actually, uh, Jeff, is opening bid is taped in front of a live studio audience, which is the Yahoo Finance newsroom. And a friend of yours, Pros Supermanian, is standing on the other side of the camera waving to you and saying hello. I mean, I, you have a lot of friends here still, here, Jeff. You got a lot of friends. Look at that. That's the Jeff Mackey pop. I'm like the road warriors. Okay? Right. It's the crowd is going crazy. Just, all right. Just... Let's, let's get, let's get this popping because I could actually do this all day. Um, out of all the podcasts that I've done, uh, I am the most nervous for this one because you did in fact show me lots of the skills that I'm using in here for this one. And let's start on consumer, but to really begin, I think on, on consumer stocks, I know you follow this stuff religiously. You have for as long as I have known you, I think people need to understand you a little bit. Your dad, essentially founded the modern day target. Maybe that's not the correct wording, but take us through a little bit of his story because I think it sets the ground for why you're so passionate and you've become an expert in all things consumer. Yeah, it's from a practical standpoint, that's about 70% of GDP. So I figure I can work backwards from if the consumer is touching it, I can understand it. And if they aren't, I'm just not that interested. But beyond that, I grew up in targets. Now there are a few families who's you know claim that their their father, grandfather, whoever was part of the the origins of Target, but really Target, Walmart and Kmart all started the same year, 61, 62, with the same basic idea, the suburbs are exploding, we need to have some stores out there and and discounts the thing. So my old man and I we would go out on weekends and we would shop Targets. And we, we, you know, it, it's, he just was, was an absolute maniac when it came to kind of obeying the planogram, what makes a good target, what kind of vibe they want, what kind of, kind of mission statement they're going for. And, and at the time it was a controversial idea, but it was sort of rich people in the suburbs like deals too. And so you keep a clean store, you respect the customer and you give them what they want and a little more so, and that's going to be a good business model. And that remains true. So, you know, it, it's my dad's been gone for a while now, rest his soul. But these fundamentals are are timeless, you know, and that is simply you got to respect the customer. And if you do and you've got a good product, you're going to figure it out. You know, it's a matter of staying in the saddle. You know what's wild? Target used to be a small division, essentially 49 stores inside of a, a department store. It's Dayton Hudson. Most people, wouldn't, I mean, they wouldn't even know that. Oh yeah, that was that was my dad was there. Geez, pre Mary Tyler Moore, he he came up from Drake <laughs> Football Night. It was shortly after after they they found a Target, but before that, it was it was the Dayton brothers, and they owned Dayton's department stores, which was largely just two or three stores. I think they had one in Rochester, one in Minneapolis. They built out that whole Minneapolis area. They were really visionaries, and and a lot of credit to the Dayton family. Um, my dad was only the second guy who was an outsider to become CEO of the organization. That was in 94. But before that, he really made his bones at Target. You know, none, none of the up and comers there wanted to be part of the department stores. They always saw that, you know, Target was going to be the explosive growth animal. Uh, you know, it's hard to say what would have happened if it would have been a freestanding company right from the jump, just the way Walmart was. Uh, you know, Kmart at the time, and one of my favorite kind of no, I hate retail Kmart. stats, I Kmart, hate Kmart. I hate Kmart. Kmart was the biggest retailer in the world for exactly yeah. three months. Yeah. The guy who founded it, Kresge, just was like, I just want to be the biggest in the world. I want to take out Sears. And he did for 1989 for like one quarter. 
And then Walmart passed them right away and just left them in the dirt because Kmart didn't give a crap about where they put their stores. But yeah, it, it's anyway, my, my blood runs pretty deep with that and I could kind of bore the people to tears, but the, the fundamentals remain the same and it's did just about want, over delivering for customers. <laughs> did you ever want to be the CEO of a retailer? Uh, you know, nope. <laughs> There's kind of, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, I've been on boards. I've been kind of involved with them. The best CEOs of retailers are guys who come up through the entire organization. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I worked for Macy's years and years ago, boy, straight out of college. And, you know, that's a grind. And, and I can't see you fold the like, clothes. I, you never struck me as the guy that's going to fold a shirt. <laughs> I just can't see it. Just fold clothes. I, I managed suits and shoes for Macy's. <laughs> I was putting shoes on men's feet in like 1993. And if you want to get that, someone out a of the retail podcast. industry, that's a different podcast. Though, it's a, it's, <laughs> it's a, a very different podcast. It's also a therapy appointment or two for me. It's a little PTSD. It, it wasn't the most glamorous or pleasant job in the world, but I can still fit a suit i can still take my son and yep. say you know what you're you're a 44 long kid and we're going to go buy you a 44 longer and i've taken the waste it, useful talents that you don't get to use all that much anymore yep. but you know you, you used to have to work the stores then and so i was there for for macy's bankruptcy which is the first of many they might be headed there again anytime soon uh, you know but it, it's we've just kind of seen that huge consolidation in the department store space that that's a dying breed the discount stores still chug along merrily all right so i'm gonna let's switch to some consumer stocks and retail stocks and i'm gonna try to put into practice everything you taught me here jeff i'm gonna do very i'm gonna try very hard also to not write lists in real time because everybody loves lists so let's start on walmart and Target. Walmart stock this year on fire, crushing it every single quarter, ripping it apart, advertising business, rocking, same store sales, rocking. Target, not so much. What is going on here and what is the best bet into the back half of the year? Of course, we have the holiday season, but oh yeah, uh, we also have a presidential election. You know, the presidential election, it, it's Democrats and Republicans. And it, my platonic ideal of a discount store, they can get along just fine. And in fact, I really think that that's important, it, it just sociologically speaking, but it, it's everyone should be able to shop. I'm not worried about the election. I'm worried about Target getting its act together. And, and you know, what they have to do, they have to do a few different things. One of which they're already done. A year ago, as you recall, they were just in a political maelstrom and on the front page of every newspaper in the country managing to just kind of tick everyone on either side of any political spectrum off. Their comps are going to be great is how that boils down to. But what they've got to do to get to the next level is build out that target circle. And that's really where Walmart has separated themselves. You mentioned the advertising business. They're going into club memberships, and you know as well as I do that discount store model is a single-digit bottom-line business. So for every buck you spend, they're lucky to make a nickel out of it. Now, if you can add some really heavy gravity top-line revenues to that, be a club store with the Costco model. People always complain to me. I'm, I'm long all three of those, and and you know, so I'm bragging about Walmart and Costco. I'm a little Costco is awesome. Cost, Jeff, I just went to Costco. I'm picking up tomahawk tomahawk steak, man. I mean, we're talking about four pounds of freaking meat for about forty bucks. I mean, Target's not selling that, and I think that's part of the problem. I mean, you go into Target, I can't get all of my shopping for food done. I'm not surprised. I'm not wowed. Where is this stuff at Target? Uh, why are they not getting this message? They've been on their back foot for, for a while. The shrink hit them huge, hit them huge, hit them really hard. And, and if you're the friendliest discount store, that it was not a setup that, that kept them kind of prepared for that rampant shoplifting sort of spree that we had, if you will, the, the, the mania that it was, the, the media kind of downplayed it a lot. But, you know, again, low margin business, if you're losing four or 5% of your product, you know, one place or another, and we're seeing where it's fenced. It's fenced in third market retail parties on online. And so what you created was this enormous fence operation for people who can sell kind of stolen product. And that made it just too lucrative to steal. And you combine that with what society went through where we're not going to prosecute anybody. And, and you know, some of the errors were, were unforced. That self-check was just one of the great debacles in retail history, the idea that, that people can just be trusted to check themselves out of stores. Jeez, that, Shocker, that, that, you that can't. Just, Shocker, you can't. Oh, I'm going to yeah. go, I'm not going to check myself out and not take six items. Yeah, it's great. 
no way to see how that's going to bite you in the ass. You know, and, and so you get people who wait in the long line and then they go up to what amounts to a glorified ATM machine, only it doesn't work quite as much. And they end up with just a lot of the bottom of the cart shrink. It just walked out the door. So they're going to, that becomes a tailwind in the back half. It's, they've all been a little sheepish about the number because there was no upside. And again, a year ago, Target was in an argument over whether or not shrink really existed. And, you know, at that point, they're taking heat because they're, they're being accused of faking these numbers. And, you know, again, the margins are so razor thin that it doesn't take much to have it be a huge operational drag and a margin drag. So Target had to lock up a lot of product. They're carrying less inventory. They made a shopping experience less pleasant for people. And they had fewer goods in stock. Mm-hmm. All of which is a super huge problem if you want to be someone's convenience store. And, you know, with the, with the margins, with Costco, what makes them so great while they can have the Tomahawk steaks is because you can pry the memberships out of people's cold dead And hands. the caskets. No one and the is caskets. Gonna be a, and the caskets. Speaking of everything, hands. Yes. You can take a lot of risk, man. If you're making a billion and a half dollars and it just goes straight to the bottom line, your cost for that is essentially printing plastic cards. That's great, you know, and, and your stores are set up that no one can walk out without the product because you're checking IDs at the door. That gives you a lot of latitude in terms of how you're going to market that. And, you know, it, it's with Walmart in a similar vein, you know, that, that margins that they can take in. You get a couple billion extra dollars, a few billion extra dollars, and it scales really well and allows you to do things that the other guys can't. So Target's building that up. That's where the upside is for them. Jeff, hang with me. We're going to go for a quick break. Don't go anywhere. we got a lot more retail and consumer to talk with. One sec. All right. Welcome back to the latest opening bid. Uh, we're talking to investor, author, retail expert, experienced trader, Wall Street Beats partner, Mr. Jeff Mackey. So, Jeff, we're talking a little bit about that battle between Walmart and Target. I'm going to check on that for a minute. I... I want to talk a little bit about a GameStop. Um, I know this is a situation you've been following a lot. Uh, I've been getting absolutely destroyed on X because of pieces that I've written about this company. I still approach GameStop, Jeff, as you can imagine, from a fundamental perspective. I don't know. I was an analyst for 10 years, and wow, I read financial statements. But it's totally detached from that reality. What is your read on GameStop? What do you think happens next and why? Uh, You know, it's a dump truck of a company to be honest it, it's you know five years ago i was actually long i had my kids accounts in it i owned it when it wouldn't when, when you know it was the four dollar stock i didn't know who roaring kitty was but i figured that you could manage this business a little better than the guys that were in charge then and you could but the problem is that that things just got out of control i had no idea why the stock spiked the way it did so i sold at 25 and i thought i was freaking just the genius of all time it went up to a split adjusted what five billion dollars or something insane like that and i you know but but so it stopped making sense from a business perspective a while ago it's a totally different company now and so what happened the other day when when you know the roaring kitty guy came out and seven hundred thousand people myself included sat there and wondered exactly how much microdosing he'd been doing and, and what the definition of micro <laughs> might be. You know, it, it's his his notion that, you know, I've done no research on it. I just really trust the company. That falls flat to guys like you and me because that hasn't really worked out The 10K out that says well. this company's garbage, uh, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't seem to matter anymore. The 10K does, the anecdotes do, the people he brought in to, to kind of fix it up <laughs> you and then to a fired. Jeff, Jeff, you ever been to a GameStop? It's so dreadful. There's like, really, there's like no lights in these stores. <laughs> and there's over 4,000 of them. No. No, it's, it, they're, and they're packed away in the mall where like the newsstand used to be and the shoe polish guy. And it's just like, you know, this is, this is probably not a growth industry and, and they're selling cassettes. So it's like Bob, you know, it's like, it's the house of VCR rentals and, you know, in a, in a modern world, and they never figured out how to go online. And, it, you know, it just as a retailer, it's nothing. Now it, where it becomes interesting, it's an $11 billion company. Ryan Cohn, to his credit, was smart enough to to kind of monetize that. Now, the cynical way of looking at it is he is exactly the type of fat cat that was pilloried and made so much fun of in this kind of, we're going to stick it to the man with our diamond hands thing. It's like, we're really going to give it to him, huh? And you, you think that's so, the W? Because that doesn't seem like the W. All right, so, so let me, so, so, what, so what is the trader in you think? You pull up a chart, wherever you get your charts from nowadays, Jeff Mackey, what do you see in the chart? Or you just say, you know what? I'm not going to be involved with the stock because it's totally detached from any form of reality. 
oh, it's catnip, no pun intended. I mean, of course, you're going to pay attention to it. How, how could you not? But it's not a retail store anymore. What it is now is just a, it's going to be a holding company. I, what I'm really interested in is, is last December, to not much fanfare, GameStop said that Ryan Cohn has full discretion over running GameStop's cash. Now, you know, that, that was never an issue when they were just a failing retailer. But what this bubble and, and you know, part two as well did was it allowed them to kind of fix up their balance sheet and, and accumulate some cash. They've already sold almost a billion dollars worth of stock since this started in May. They filed to sell 75 million shares, which is just bonkers at the time. That would have been like four or five billion dollars and an $11 billion market cap company with kind of garbage retailers that lose a little bit of money, but they don't matter anymore because now it's a holding company. And so it, it's kind of Berkshire Hathaway for suckers or said more nicely, Berkshire Hathaway for people who just have a ton of confidence in Ryan Cohen's ability to look out for them and, and you know, be, be the steward of their capital, a la Berkshire Hathaway. Now, the difference is Ryan Cohen's not much of an investor as you far know, as I actually challenged him, Jeff. I actually, so our big conference here at Yahoo Finance is November 12th. It's the Invest Conference. You're, of course, invited, Jeff. But I actually challenged Ryan Cohen in my Thank column you. last weekend uh, to come debate me at Invest. Uh, why does he like this company? Why is he holding seven-minute earnings calls or, in some cases, no earnings calls? I mean, I think he has a whole world of investors that have shown some form of confidence in him. And doesn't he owe it to come out here and explain what he is doing? Or maybe it's just me. Maybe he owes nobody anything. Uh, he would. You know, you, you've got to earn the right to not owe anybody anything. So far, what he's done it is, you know, he had he, just a bunch of sketchy kind of options-based runs at companies that he's taken in the past. He's got control of GameStop. He, he made that run. He made some $60 million personally, not for GameStop, via uh, Bed Bath & Beyond with what looked a little like a pump and dump. It technically wasn't, but it just kind of smelled like it a little bit. That's different than running $5 billion of cash for GameStop. Now, what you should challenge him on is less if GameStop itself is a turnaround story as a retailer, because frankly, it's not. That's kind of a short debate. It, it, you, know, you, you just kind of look at the numbers. Like you say, the 10K speaks for itself. But the question is whether or not he can manage that money and find other compelling values. Because if he can, that's where the Berkshire Hathaway model kicks in. Berkshire Hathaway was just a failing textile company that Warren Buffett turned into a holding concern. Mm -hmm. That's what the super duper duper crazy bullish argument is, is that he's going to be able to take whatever they sold out of that $75 million ATM appropriately called at the money transaction sales share sale opportunity. If he raised a bunch of money, you're going to talk about a company with three, $4 billion cash, how he's going to put that to work. And frankly, kind of the worst option available is putting it back into GameStop. I mean, it, it's going to be whether you can find other things to buy. Let's Let's go to another retailer. And it was interesting. I went back into a lot of the segments we did way back when. I think this was like 2012. So at the time, I, I had spent a week visiting Starbucks stores. This is when I was still an analyst. And I would just sit in these stores, Jeff, for hours, writing notes down, taking things down that I saw that seemed weird. Why are there so many steps between the cash register and the coffee pot? Whatever it was, I was just really in a different point in my career. And I was trying to understand what was wrong with Starbucks. And... You had had me on, and we broke down what was, I think, like three problems that Starbucks was brewing up. And I feel as though we're back at that point some 12-plus years later. Here's a company, Starbucks, pulling in lots of money, but, I mean, the sales are under pressure. Uh, that's despite mobile ordering. The prices for its products gotten too high. And you're not getting any clear answers for management on how they're going to turn these things around except to say we're coming out with a new energy drink. What, it, what do you see as the problem with Starbucks? And when does that stock, what has to happen for that stock to work again? Yeah, I think that the stock may be a little washed out in the near term. It, it's, I kind of called it on Wall Street Pizza, which we were talking about before, that this was a company that just needed to warn. And, and they've lost their way in a few simple ways. But really what it comes down to is, is it's an antiquated business model. They have way too many stores that people are supposed to hang out in. Starbucks doesn't want people to hang out and no one's going to hang out there. The days of the starving screenwriter hanging out all day at your Starbucks are gone. You know, the days if they of sold business me a good lunch, are gone. If they sold me a good lunch, Jeff, I would sit in Starbucks. But the reality is I'm not sitting in Starbucks. I mean, who's doing that? It's Howard Schultz always pitched Howard that Schultz to Howard Schultz has spent 35 years yeah. trying to sell people food. No one wants food. Nobody wants food I, from Starbucks. 
no, no. I had my daughter buy Dutch Bros, which <laughs> is just, you know, Starbucks for kids. But what they've got that Starbucks is desperately trying to imitate are all kind of those things that it, they did. They just give me the goober loos, as they used to call them. It's like that thing where you, you know, it, it's it's like a mocha chino frappa, whatever, with like eight different pumps of grenadine in it. You know, finally an eight hundred calorie caffeinated beverage that I can that I can choke down. I, you know, I love none of them, but you go there and the lines are out the door. Mm-hmm. The margins are fat. The the demand is incredible. The young people are there. All the things that Starbucks is desperately trying to do and is not very good at. So at, at Starbucks, you're retrofitting what is just supposed to be five different kinds of coffee and different sizes into all these spectacular custom drinks. And that's not what they're good at. Young well, you're people not down. You're not. You're not down for the coffee. You're not down for the coffee at Starbucks with the olive oil in it, Jeff. I mean, I, that doesn't excite you. Uh, not. You know what doesn't excite me is being forced <laughs> to use an app. And then have that app not work to actually make purchases. And then I go there. I mean, in the last conference call, almost 20% of the people that use the app don't complete the order. So they're they're equating the app with with kind of this customer loyalty program. You want to make me disloyal? Just screw me on the app. Make me tap my way through 50 different screens on your app, and then I'll show up and my coffee's not there. That's a huge raging problem. That that's a problem no matter how you look at it. Like we talked about under promising overperforming that's the opposite you promised me i would buy a coffee for seven dollars and now it's not here i don't have an unlimited amount of time people want in and out they want the drive throughs they want to go real quick and they want to kind of get their beverage and and starbucks has lost their way on that i i think that if they just focus on execution and stop with the initiatives, my God, the, the double pump, triple wraparound <laughs> initiatives that they're doing. I, I mean, it's run by consultants and right, so bonkers. It's not the way you should run a consumer company. Uh, okay, so uh, we're running out of time here, Jeff. So this is what I got down. You did Costco, kind of dig Walmart. Target's got some work to do. Feeling Dutch Bros, not feeling Starbucks. In the last minute and a half that we got, can you maybe inspire a little bit the next generation investors? How do they become a successful trader? What's the one thing that you look for when you wake up in the morning to make that great trade? I want the guys eating off the dying corpses of the big installed companies. The two trades I've been working this year, anybody but Starbucks, anybody but Nike. Will those trades work forever? Probably not. But in the meantime, you've got Hoka boot stomping with kind of both Uggs and running shoes, taking market share, taking shelf space away from Nike. You have you have on holdings, you know, which is a goofy little Swiss company, but everyone talks about the threats to Lululemon. On holding is so much farther down the road than Viore or Allo because they're actually kind of getting installed into these foot lockers of the world and they're taking share. Find an old company that you don't like mm-hmm. and see what it's being replaced with. The consumer doesn't go anywhere. They just move around. People are going to like, we're addicted to caffeine. Mm-hmm. America is plenty stoked yeah. up and ready to speed themselves. Who wins when Starbucks loses? Who wins when Nike loses? If you want to get excited about stuff, yep. you know, stick it to the map in the real way. You want kids to be excited about investing? Take yep. an old company. This is grandpa's company. I'm going to find grandkids company. I'm going to make money from that. Jeff uh, Mackey, um, we're out of time. I will just say this. As they say in WWE now, Jeff, um, you still got it. Uh, thank you for uh, making time for uh, opening bid for me personally uh, and, and showing me the ropes uh, all these years. Jeff Mackey, follow this guy uh, on Twitter, Wall Street Beats, investor, author, retail expert, uh, just an all-around good guy. Jeff, thank you so much. Thanks, man. It was great. All right, and that's it for the latest episode of Opening Bid.